Wow, well, it's good to be here, and I hope you feel the same way. Please open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 31 through 33. And before we start reading, as you're looking for that in your Bible, I, today we've come to the conclusion of our series on the five pillars of marriage from Ephesians 5. And, and, and notice with me the final pillar from verses 31 through 33 of Ephesians chapter 5. It says this, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying it, saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Father, we, we just thank you again for this series. We thank you how it's spoken to all of our hearts, especially this preacher, Father. And I just pray today that we would finish strong, that the Spirit would just move in this room and would just bring healing to some relationships. Even, even after the message, as we have a time of rededication or a time of refocus, I just pray, dear Lord, that you would just speak loud and clear to, to the couples that will be part of that. So, Father, speak now with your voice, and I pray that we would have the ears to listen. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A cowboy preacher once said, he said this, You may tie the tails of a cat and a dog together by a rope, and you may have a union, but you surely don't have unity. And uh, in the same wisdom, a couple may be married and yet not have unity. The text before us today is, is all about unity, and it's the conclusion to a discussion on marriage. Uh, the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, has already given us four powerful foundations for marriage. You'll remember, number one, it's on the overhead. Uh, both husband and wife need to be spirit-filled. And it's impossible to love like God loves us without the Spirit filling and controlling us, but when we are controlled by the Spirit of God, and again, every week I've been going over this, when we're full and, co and controlled by the Spirit of God, we are full of joy, patience, uh, peace, patience. You know, it's a wonderful ingredient for a marriage. I heard about a Quaker farmer who had a stubborn mule, and most farmers would get impatient and strike the mule to get them to go, but the, the Quaker's religion kept him uh, from doing that, and one day he said to his mule, he said, Thou knowest I can't kick or hit thee because of my religion. Thou knowest I must be patient. But what thou don't knowest is that I can sell thee to an Episcopalian. <laughs> anyway, you know, patience is good for a marriage, isn't it? Galatians 5 tells us also that when the Spirit is in control of our lives, we will be kind to one another. A husband and wife, they're going to be kind, gentle to one another. Goodness will flow from us. We will be faithful to one another. Uh, gentle, we will be full of self-control, singing and making melody uh, in our hearts to the Lord. And we will be thankful for everything in our lives. The situations we find ourselves in, uh, the trials uh, our families, and especially our spouse. And according to verse 21, we will also submit to each other for Christ's sake. Now, these are, these are pillars. In fact, pillar number two is that mutual submission that we looked at weeks ago. When we are filled and when we are controlled by the Spirit, we won't demand our way or our agenda, but rather we're going to submit one to another. And in the context of Ephesians chapter 5, it relates to husbands and wives, children and parents, servants and masters, employees and employers. Pillar number 3 comes from verse number 22 in the text. It says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And again, I'm just giving you a brief overview of what we've already looked at. And if you miss some of those, you're welcome to go online and, and to hear those. But the husband is to lead the wife because he's responsible for that relationship. 
Number four is the husband is to love his wife. Husbands, agape your wives. Verse 25, love them with God's love. It's a sacrificial love, a love that gives its all uh, with nothing held back. A husband is to give his all for his bride, and in our example that we saw was Jesus Christ. Verse 25, notice it, it says this, Husbands, love your wives as who? As Christ loved the church. And what did he do? I love it. He says he gave himself up for her. And the husbands, that is our duty. That is our call. That's our role. We are to give ourselves up for our bride, for our wife. This verse stuck with me all week. And, and uh, you know, I kept trying to tell the Holy Spirit that it was time to move on to pillar number five. And uh, it, it just, you know, I said, hey, we're, we're good with pillar number four. But no, no, all week I kept thinking about this uh, verse. You know, so often our love, my love, is is what I call a reactive type of love. I mean, if I am receiving love, then it's easy to be sacrificial in the love that I give back. And many of you might say the same thing. But that's not how Christ loved his church, is it? It's not. And all week, the Holy Spirit was just grinding on me and, and revealing that truth to me from Ephesians 5. You know, Christ loved me and I was his enemy. I was rotten to the core. I loved darkness rather than light. Uh, I took his name in vain. My father was the devil. And I love what Romans 5 says, verses 6 through 8. You don't need to turn there, but let me read it to you. You can make a note of it and go read it later. Romans 5 says this, For while we were still weak, we were weak, we were away from God, at the right time, that perfect time, Christ died for who? The ungodly. That's who Christ died for, the ungodly, those who hated him. And he goes on, he says this, he says, he's trying to reason with us. He goes on and, and he says, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person. So maybe if we had a righteous person, we would say, you know what, I'll, I'll, listen, I'll, I'll give my life to save that righteous person because they're a good person. And he goes on, he says, though perhaps, maybe even somebody would, would die for a good person. And so we have righteous, and then we have a good person. A good person one would dare even to die for. And then I love this. It says, but God. Say that, but God. One more time, I gotta hear that. But God. What did God do? Listen to this. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so for a righteous person, somebody would give their life up. Maybe even for a good person, somebody. But what did God do? For sinners, you and I, he allowed himself to be nailed to a cross. Sinners. We gave him no glory. I gave him no glory. We hated him. We hated who he was, his restraints on our life. I put him on the cross. My sin, my guilt, my shame, but God. But God, he agape me. He loved me. And I, and I am to love my wife with that type of love. That's what our text tells us. And all week I've been just thinking about that and realizing how short I fall in that area. And I just, I just need to, just to get on my knees and apologize to my wife. But today, we've come to verses 31 through 33. It's the conclusion of this whole series, this passage on husbands and wives. And, and notice the outline in your bulletin. Number one, I want to get right into it because we're going to do something afterwards. Um, notice number one. Number one is the permanence. The permanence. Pillar number five is unity. We have to have unity in a marriage. You know, I, I was going to spend some time talking about unity. Listen, unity, you better have unity in a church. Amen? Amen? If you don't, it's done. You need to have unity in a home. You need to have unity in a marriage. And verse 31a talks about the permanence of that relationship. 
Notice verse 31a, it says, therefore, therefore. Therefore refers back to what Jesus had just talked about, and that was husbands and wives. And what did he talk about? What, was the, what does our text say? It says we've got to be spirit-filled. We've got to be mutual submission has to take place. Wives submitting, husbands loving. And so how is the Apostle Paul going to wrap this up for us today? Verse 31a. He says this, therefore, because of that, because of the teaching I just gave you, he says, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. The Greek word for joined or hold fast or cleave, whatever your translation says in your Bible, uh, is proskoleo, and it, it's an interesting word. It, it means to glue, to glue something together, or to cement, or really one of the other e just easy to understand uh, definitions is when you take something and you stick it to something else. And that's what he says there. And so uh, in our context of our text, a husband is to be glued, cemented, or stuck to his wife. And, um, and how does that happen? Well, by leaving mommy and daddy. It says that in the text. You know, that's my translation. Uh, you can't be glued to your wife while mother is still holding on, right? You can't do that. Or dad is still holding on to his daughter. And this passage speaks of permanence. Um, the husband and wife are not just to be glued together because some glue is meant to come apart later on, but really they are to be laminated together uh, permanently. There's no separation. It's to be permanent, this thing called marriage. You know, I know Lynette and I in our marriage early on, you know, we faced uh, hard times just like all of you have. And, 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 but from day one, for her and I, divorce was not an option. It just wasn't. Amen. We said, we're not going to do it. We can't do it. God doesn't want it to happen. It's just not going to happen. And so we worked through all those problems, the issues that arose over the years. And yes, God did allow divorce. I get it. But he said it's because of their hardness of heart. But that's another message. And, uh, but th know, know this. Marriage is till death do we part. Amen? Amen. That's what it is. Notice also the perplexity of, of this unity in verse 31b. He goes on and he says this, the two shall become one flesh. Okay? And uh, a husband and wife uh, become this one flesh at marriage. They get glued together. They stick together. And Paul quotes Genesis 2.24 here in our text. And in Genesis 2, God saw that Adam was lonely, and you don't want, need to take the time now to read that, but sometime read that this week. Uh, Adam was lonely. The livestock, they had other livestock to hang around with and to, to just help each other. The birds had other birds. That's what Genesis chapter 2 says. But Adam, he had no one, and the Bible says, who was fit for him who was fit, who was compatible for him. And so what did God do? God put Adam in a deep sleep, and God took one of Adam's ribs and, and made a woman, and he brought her to Adam. That's what the text says. Uh, Jewish tradition says this, that one day Eve was jealous of Adam and thought there might be another woman. And so when he came back home from working in the garden, she said, come here, and she counted his ribs. Okay, that was a joke, okay, because... Come on. You, uh, you, wow. Okay. Woman was taken from man. There might be another woman. Count the ribs. Are you missing a rib? Is there another woman? All right. But, you know, the interesting thing was Adam instantly, he understood the oneness and the unity uh, of Eve and him. He understood that because when he saw Eve, he said this. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. We are one. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Th then God says this, and here's our 
verse that we're talking about right now. And then God said immediately, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And I'll say more about that during the application time. Notice number three, the pitcher. And I, this is just amazing, amazing, nothing short of amazing. Verse 32, it says this, This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. The word profound in the Greek is megas, and President Trump, he translated this word as huge. Uh, but, you know, but this is, this picture, it's an exceedingly great, that's what it means. It's megas, it's profound, it's exceedingly great, it's profound, it's mighty, it's a mystery. And don't miss this. Our marriages, and we've talked about this for the past few weeks, our marriages are to point people to Jesus Christ. It's a picture. And this is what the whole story that we've talked about, this whole passage, that's what it's about. Christ in the church, the husband and the wife. Notice verse 23b. I'm just going to point yourself how all through our passage, all through this text, Paul has been making this point about Christ in the church and how it relates to the husband and the wife. In verse 23b, I'm just going to kind of cut in and out of these verses, but just to make the point. Verse 23b, even as Christ is the head of the what? The church, right? His body and is himself its savior. Verse 24, now as the what? Church submits to Christ, so also wives, okay? Verse 25, as Christ loved the what? Church and gave himself up for her. Verse 27, so that he might present the church, to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish, blameless before him. And that alone is so exciting for us because Jesus Christ is going to present us, his bride, us. We are the church. We are going to be presented without spot or wrinkle, blameless before a righteous, holy God because of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen? Amen? Verse 29, it goes on. Just as Christ does the church. Verse 32b, it refers to Christ and the church. And hold on, Turbo, hold on. Is this passage about Christ and his church, or is it about marriage? What's it about? Exactly. It's about both. It's a, it's a profound mystery is what the Apostle Paul called it. Profound mystery. My marriage is a picture of Christ and his bride, who's the church. And the truth of the matter is this. I will never reach a lost and dying world until my marriage, me and my partner, my helper and I, my house, until we reflect Christ and his bride in my marriage, in our marriage. That's how it works. My witness, my testimony is at stake, and it will be viewed by those outside the church, outside these doors, regarding what they see in my marriage. Testimony, that's what it is. Notice number four, the priority. The priority. He's going to remind us something here. Verse 33, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. The word, however, he starts verse 33. This is kind of, it's plan, plan in the Greek. And it's, it's, the, it's the ending to this discussion on marriage. He's saying, however, here's a conclusion to it. But is, he's going to summarize this discussion with two priorities about marriage. And this is nothing new. Number one, <coughs> he says, husbands love. And it's that agape word again. Love. Love your wife. Men, it begins and ends with us. I'm just going to tell you that right again. We've talked about that the last few weeks. It begins and ends with us. We are to love our wives with a love that is just like God's love for us. 
And did you notice the two words that follow this teaching? He wrote, as himself. Love your wife as yourself, as himself. When I, and, and the point is this. When I love my wife sacrificially, really I'm loving myself as well. Why? Because two of us became one. And so when I love her, I love myself. It's a joint thing. It's good. It's good for our marriage. It's good for her. It's good for me. God has joined or glued us together. So when I love Lynette, I'm also loving myself. But it's to be all about her. I'm to make it all about her. Sacrificial love. It's not about me. It's about her. And we're all working on that. I'm working on that. Why? Because the picture. Remember the picture. Why do I make it about my bride? Because Christ made it all about his bride, didn't he? He did. And what a glorious, profound picture this thing called marriage is. It's just profound. It's glorious. Wow, I have the opportunity to live out the picture of Christ and his bride before a lost and dying world. I have that opportunity in my life, in my marriage, to live that out for people to see it and to say, something's different. Something's different. What, what is it? What's going on in your life? And then the second picture that he's saying here, the second c- conclusion is that wives are to make sure they respect their husbands. And this, c- this command, I want to remind you, ladies, is not conditional. It's not conditional. Okay, if he's kind, then respect him. Okay? Does it say that? It does not say that. If he's rich, respect him. It doesn't say that either, does it? No, the the bride is to respect her husband just as the church, Christ's bride, loves and respects Jesus Christ. That's how it works. And this word respect is a... In the original language of the New Testament, it's fabeo, and and it means this. It means to be in awe of something or to revere. And Robert is demanding that of his wife right now. Kathy, he's going, hey, you ought to be in awe of me. Okay, we'll talk later about that. That's, you know, that's not the point here, really. But what is the point? To be in awe is this, is is the, you ladies, you look at your husband and you go, that's my husband, that's him. God gave him to me. He put him in my life. That's God's present to me. He's such a blessing to me. Oh, I love him. I, he's not perfect. He's a dirty dog most of the time. But I love him. I do. But he protects me and he takes care of me and and you know what? I'm just in awe of him his, and his love for me. And uh, thank you, Lord, for giving him to me. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move to the application. Number one, your spouse must be the priority. Must be the priority. And, and, and don't put your spouse before God, okay? Somebody's going to go home and say, Pastor said... We've got to put our, our mate, our spouse, before we put God in our lives. I didn't say that. Don't put your spouse before God. And in the same way, don't put the church before your spouse. Amen? Amen. That's important. Uh, but give your spouse the priority position in your life. You know, in my life, I, I'm working on this. And, and it's a real struggle as a pastor for me. It's not because I don't love my wife. It's because the requirements and the call on my life for being a pastor and the phone calls and we'll be in the middle of a discussion about something. Last night we were and and here comes the phone ring and I get a text and something's going on. I got to speak to somebody and it's like, hold that. Let's pause, pause it, pause it. I'll get back to you. Not good, not good. I need counseling from, from the veteran missionaries. But God needs to be first. My wife needs to be second. The church needs to be third. But pastor, you're the pastor. Hey, number three. You're not number two, right? My wife comes number two. And that's hard as a pastor, but it must be that way. It must be. That's what it says. The kids, some of you ladies are going, that's right, amen. 
Let me say this. The kids do not come before your spouse. They don't. Don't put your kids before your husband. Your parents, your brothers, sisters, friends, the job do not come before your spouse. They do not. Maybe I I just thought about a few things. You know what? It would be good for all of us. You know what? Set a date night. And you say, I don't have any, I don't have much money. Who cares? Go find a chair under the stars somewhere and sit down and talk. Uh, maybe a special dinner. You know, barbecue the hot dogs. Don't just put them, boil them in water. Make it special. <laughs> How about a road trip? Take a road trip. Drive to La Quinta. Drive, drive to Desert Hot Springs. You know, uh, talk about the good memories of yesteryear. Lynette and I love to do that. We, we, we like, we're just so proud of our children, and we, we'd love just to talk about our kids and, and how God used us over the years in certain people's lives, and not bragging, but just a good time, just to say, you know, God's, and our conclusion is always the same, amazing grace. God's been good to us, and um, wow. Wow. How about this? Maybe dream together concerning the future. Dream. What does God want from us? Strategize how we are going to serve God together. How are we going to finish the race together and and in a powerful way for Jesus Christ? How does God want to use us? He's not done with us. He hasn't taken us home yet. And so I want to finish strong. I want to complete that race. Sometimes we need just to sneak away with our spouse. Just sneak away. Say, get in the car, let's go. And maybe you don't come home for a couple days. Wouldn't that be nice? Amen. <laughs> I think the point is this. Make your spouse feel as though they are the most important person in your life. Amen. That goes a long ways. Number two, you can't cleave unless you first leave. Right? Everybody say that. You can't cleave unless you first leave. You've got to leave your parents. Asking advice is okay from mom and dad. But there comes a point when you've got to leave. You've got to cut the cord. And I understand the God-given mandate to take care of your parents. And many of you are at that place in your lives right now in their old age. But never put parents or anyone else before your spouse. That's what God says. Leave and cleave. Leave and join, be joined together. Number three is this. Love is always the goal. I I just, this week, again, when when the uh, Holy Spirit wouldn't set me free from the fact that I have to love Lynette like Christ loved the church, and I'm not sure I'm even done with that yet, and I'm surely not done living it out yet. I know that, but... This week, I just I re- reread 1 Corinthians 13 that talked all about agape love and, and what love really is, patience, kind, good. It's just all those things, and that's how I need to be. That's what my love needs to be for my wife. She's mine. God gave her to me, and, and I'm to rejoice in him and just to be selfless in front of, front of her and in front of the lost and dying world as well. And I kept reading Ephesians 5 over and over again just to, just to get the flavor of the chapter, what, what Paul, through the Holy Spirit, through Paul, was trying to say, not to you, not to the world, but to me in my life. What is he trying to tell me? How am I supposed to, to live before the world? And how am I supposed to love my spouse and keep it fresh and exciting and, 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 and make new and be new and adventurous in our relationship? And how am I going to sacrifice for my bride? And how are you going to sacrifice for your husband? Maybe I thought, maybe, you know what? I need to um, write a letter to my wife, a love letter, huh? Put a little cologne on it, you know? <laughs> We used to do that in college 40-something 40, 40 years ago. We used to do that. You know, you get the old high karate and you shake it up and you just like douse that thing and you uh, drop, it in the, drop it in the mail. And two weeks later, she'd get the envelope, you know. But, you know, listen, love is always the goal. 
Love is the goal. We are nothing, nothing without love. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If, if you have love one for another. And where, if, if I'm supposed to love you like that, how much more am I supposed to love my wife like that? Wow. The picture. The picture. The picture. And don't send your wife a text and call that a letter, okay? <laughs> don't do it. Number four. And every week I've been, we've been talking about this, and we're going to revisit it one last time. We're going to close the service with this. Number four, the purpose of my marriage is to bring God what? Glory. Glory. Right. That's the purpose of my marriage. 1 Corinthians 10.31, that's what it's based on. It says this, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the what? Glory of God. I'm going to read that one more time. So whether you eat or drink or whatever, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Whether you're going to the Philippines, whether you're going to Awana, whether you're going to Latin America, whether you're, whatever you're going to do, and that includes your marriage. We want to do it all for the glory of God. My marriage needs to bring God glory. Amen? Amen. That's what it is. And there are some here today and who need to refocus. And we all need to refocus sometimes, don't we? We do. And there's some here today that maybe even need to rededicate their marriage to the glory of God. And I'm going to ask the elders if they would come up right now. And uh, today, if you'd like to have one of our elders pray over you as a couple, and maybe you say, Pastor, my wife is, is gone today, or she's, something's going on in her life, she can't be here, then you, you just come up and allow these elders to pray. David, come on up, you two come up too. And just spread out here, guys, okay? And uh, I'm going to ask you, when Melissa is going to come up, and she's going to uh, sing a song, and it, it, the song that she's going to sing, it talks about giving Christ that position of first place in our lives. And, and she says, well, you know, it's not really about marriage. And I'm going, it sounds to me like it is about marriage because it's about giving Christ that first position in our marriage. And when we do that, it's going to change our marriage. I promise you that. And so I'm just going to ask you just to remain seated. But maybe you're here today and you would say, you know what? I just, I just want God to know that I'm striving to bring him glory in my marriage. And that, um, that's, the, that's the cry of my heart. And that's what we're going to do. And you know what? Don't, don't look around. Don't gossip. Nothing like that. Maybe you need to come up and just... Anyway, Bart, maybe spread out a little more. Separate. Just kind of separate. You guys are over here behind me. And uh, just come up and ask one of the elders to just, uh, if they would pray over your marriage, you and your wife. Would you do that? Come now as she sings.